uh, welcome back to the last uh, session of uh, today's uh, for, uh, so, uh, research in options so on that Monday. Um, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Beatrice uh, at Chayo. Just for the record for the 30 seconds, I really love how we actually met. I remember it was in Santa Barbara. Jean-Pierre Fouque had kindly invited me to give a mini course <laughs> and a seminar. And uh, I don't know, so it was the questions at the end of the mini of the seminar and remember and then it was plenty of uh, students uh, phd students and master students at uh, santa barbara and there was this uh, student that was she was asking like very tough questions and hard questions and i was like wow she's really you know strong and and of course i actually knew your paper but actually i had never seen the picture of you <laughs> so i didn't know and of course it was actually beatrice and you were actually in a sabbatical at uh, at that time uh, from LSE, you are now at uh, ETH uh, Zurich. Uh, Beatrice uh, is uh, yeah one of the great names in mathematical uh, finance. Uh, she has had many contributions in math finance and in particular in uh, optimal transport. And so today you're going to talk about model independence in a fixed income market and the uh, weak uh, optimal transport. So Beatrice, the virtual uh, stage is yours. Thank you, Julien, for the very nice introduction. Thanks to the organizer for making this possible, even if, of course, with our hearts, we are all in Rio, uh, you know, hopefully next year. So I will present um, a joint work, which is with uh, Matthias Spiegelbock, old friend and old collaborator of mine, and uh, Gudmund Palmer, which is the young in this collaboration, which means that he did the art job. So good morning is finishing his PhD with Matthias, and he will join me as a postdoc at ETH uh, in spring. So let's jump into the talk. Uh, I will talk of model independence uh, in a fixed income market, as the title say. So let's just recall, you know, most of the people here, I'm sure that they know what is a model independent framework, but let's recall what is the typical setting that we have in mind when we think of robust finance. So usually we think that we are already in discounted, uh, working discounted terms, uh, that we have, um, a continuum of call option on a certain asset, say at certain time TIs. And then from this, of course, we can recover what is the distribution of the asset as a time TI under any Martingale measure, which is compatible with the uh, prices observed in the market. And then what we usually do, we suppose that we have this marginal at several times, and then we want to have robust pricing of exotic options that depends on the value of the asset at all those times. And beautiful tools, of course, they come from, for example, optimal transport or score code embedding uh, theories that, you know, suppose that we know distributions, right? So at certain times. And typically one of the uh, beautiful results in this series to have super replication duality. So thanks to the previous talk of, uh, we have at least two talk of Jan and uh, Julien on uh, optimal transport. So we all got refreshed of this um, notions. I don't, need to add anything else. And also thanks to the talk of uh, Martin about, you know, numerator and discounting, we are already ready for what I'm uh, introducing uh, now. Because now with this setting, what we are implicitly assuming is that we have a deterministic numerator, right? Because if you observe, so if you look here, this formula that we all know very well, when we want to price something, the price in the market, right, that we observe, they will have to correspond to the expectation under any Martingale measure of the discounted payoff, right? So here I see that we have uh, calls, so this would be what we uh, observe in the market for every K. So when we say that from the call options, right, for every cycle on a certain time TI, we can deduce the distribution of STI under Q, so implicitly we are saying that this B is deterministic, right, so we can take it out. And then, of course, if we have the expectation of all the acoustic functions, I can recover a distribution. Now, if B is stochastic, we cannot do that, right? We cannot take B out. We can say, well, you know, let's put it inside here, inside the acoustic function, and then we have S over B. But again, we cannot get the distribution of S over B, because now here I would have K over B, so I would have a stochastic uh, here strike. So I cannot deduce the law neither of S nor of discounted S if B is stochastic. So what do we do? In the case of stochastic interest rate, we cannot use 
the usual, let's say, tools from optimal, optimal transport and scoreboard embedding because we don't have this nice, nice trick of getting the marginals. So what we will do in this work, first step towards understanding what can be done anyway. So we will not assume the existence of deterministic discounting or actually of any bank account at all. But, you know, to have an idea of what is the value of money in time, we assume that there are bonds which are traded in the market. So we are in a fixed income market. We can also consider bond and stock. But today I will give an example uh, in particular with bonds. And spoiler alert. So since we use we have bonds, we will use them as numeraire, which means that the measure now that we are looking at under which we do the pricing, they are not the usual let's say, Martingale measure when we discount with a bank account, but they are the so-called forward measures. I will re just refresh all this uh, in the next uh, slide. So notation-wise, I will call T bond, a zero coupon bond with maturity T. And with P, I will denote the price at time little t of a T bond, right? So the price in little t, the value in little t of having one uh, franc at time capital T. And QT now is the T forward measure. What does it mean? Well, it's the right measure when I'm discounting with the bond, right? So if I discount every traded S with the bond, now this discounted asset is a QT martingale. Good, then usual formulas, right? Phi is just that instead of our, uh, it's a martingale Q for the bank account, we have the T forward measure, but otherwise same formula, right? So the discounted value is the conditional expectation of the discounted payoff which means that if I have prices of T calls, or calls with maturity T on an asset S, then I have the law of S capital tender QT. So if we are here, then we say, well, then it's exactly the same. But now I did put this in orange, because now if I have the price of calls at time T, I know the distribution under QT, so the forward measure at this maturity, which means that now if we observe call option at two different maturities, T1 and T2, I have the distribution of the asset S at, at the two different times under two different measures, right? So here we understand mathematically, oops, that's something that now we need to take care of because it's not nice to have distribution under different probabilities. So what are the two options where we stick with it? We have the distribution, but we have different measure. What can we do? Or we try to pick a unique measure, but then of course, if we change to one measure, we will lose something about the loss, right? But still, we would not know how to go on in the, in the first uh, case, so we decide to pick a unique measure, right? So we would pick a unique forward measure. To see which one we pick, let's, let's see, uh, a, a simple, even in a simple setting, how things can get complicated. So let's just take three maturities, T1, T2, T3. We have the bonds for this maturity which are dynamically traded, and as a static part of the trading, we have on the we have the T1 call, so calls with um, maturity T1 on the T2 bond and calls with maturity T2 on the T3 bond. So I will try if you if hopefully this works nicely to picture this. So the idea is that we have for the T3 bond, we have the maturity, we have the calls with maturity T2, which means that here. Uh, I, yeah. I, I think we're seeing your ceiling, so maybe it's just not in the right direction. No? So you're not seeing the, the slides. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah sorry, we on the side, that slide. That works. We okay, okay, sorry, sorry. I thought okay. you were trying to, okay, that's perfect, sorry about that. Yeah, no, no, no problem. You're right that you're seeing the ceiling because I'm writing on my, on my uh, computer, <laughs> but you can see that I'm writing on the slides. That's correct, yeah, that's, that's all good. Okay, good. So here the point is that, so we observe P2, uh, uh, P1, P2, 3. And same thing, so for the T2 bond, right, we observe the call option at the previous time, which means that we have the distribution P1, 2. Okay, so now the point is what happened if I'm trying to understand if I have some derivative of P1, 3. Right. So the idea, for example, we have that, um, for example, uh, caplets, uh, which are, you know, written, let's say, for example, on the libraries, they are much more liquid when the 
difference between the reset date and settlement date is six months. So for example, if I think that Ti plus one minus Ti is six months, then we do indeed have that couplets, which can be, you know, couplets and forwards can be written as a call and put on the bond, right? So we do have indeed that those calls are, and those ones are more liquid than the one between time T1 and 3. So we can think that we know this distribution P1, 2, P2, 3, and we want to understand P1, 3. Even more generally, we can, we could replace this bond with any asset, right? We would say that we know the distribution of S2, we know how to go from time 2 to time 1, and we could ask what happened to the derivative of S1, okay? So this is just a bit to have in mind that we know things within time uh, 2 and 3, time 1 and 2, and we want to understand what happened between time 1 and time uh, 3. So now we should be able to see me again instead of the, the ceiling. Uh, so this is the uh, this is what we have in mind. Uh, I'm not. Can you still see my slides? I can see your slide, but we still see your ceiling. Uh, okay, that is strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it is not pointed toward the ceiling, but I think there is some little glitch. But let's. Uh, if you're okay not to see me, I think it's important that you see the slides rather than me. I won't comment. Yeah, so can you see that I'm changing slides <laughs> at least? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, very good. So again, so we have in mind that we have this very simple setting, time 1, 2, and 3. Again, we have information at time T2 and the T3 bond, at time T1 and the T2 bond, and we want to understand between time 1 and time 3, meaning that now I can also put T2, 1, to 2, but what I was saying before, right? We try to understand what is the, now if we have some options written on the, uh, PT1, T3, right? Or if you want on everything that we have at time T1, right? 1, 2, and 1, 3. And what we want to do, same things. We want to have uh, semi-static uh, super replication variety. We want to understand, you know, pricing, so primal and dual uh, optimizers. Okay, so let's uh, establish exactly now, which measure we pick, because I said that we have three times, one, two, and three. So it would be convenient indeed to use uh, the T2 bond as numerator, which means that we consider every uh, T2 for our measure as a possible measure for pricing. So what does it mean? Well, we want to express, as in every like um, uh, numerator discounting, we want to express everything in terms of the T2 bond. So the T1 bond discounted in the T2 bond we will call Xi, the T3 bond Yi, and of course the T2 bond in terms of the T2 bond is just the identity. So now the observed market prices, it turns out to be in the following way. So again, we want to write everything in terms of uh, the T2 for our measures. So the first line corresponds to all the call options written with maturity T1 on a T2 bond. And the second line, on the call options written with maturity T2 written on the T3 bond. So if you look at the right hand side, so what do we get from them? We get the distribution under QT2 of X1 and Y2. Okay, so I denote them with mu and nu. So now if you remember what we wanted to price, right? We want to price derivatives, all derivatives with maturity, let's say T1, right? On these two guys. And this is, you can easily see from what X and Y are, that finally we can have this way of writing our derivatives. So we have functions that depend on X1 and Y1. Okay, so X1 is 1 over P12, Y1, P13 over P12. But, you know, mathematically we can just even forget for a moment where we come from and say, well, you know, we know the law of X1, we know the law of Y2, and now I want to price a function that depends on x1, for which we know the distribution, mu, and y1, for which we do not know the distribution. So here we see the difference with the normal uh, transport problem that we are used uh, to uh, study, where we have a cost function, and we know the distribution of both marginals. So in this case, we know the distribution of the first marginal, but for the second one, right, for y1, we don't know the distribution, but we know that y is a q2 marking, right? So we know that y1 is dominated in convex order by nu, 
Okay, so we don't know why one, but we know the distribution of something that dominates it in, co in convex order. So this is what we will use, right? So um, it seems that still we cannot see everything. So uh, some notations so I will denote with Q and K, all marking uh, compatible for a measure. What does it mean? All the good pressing measures, right? So to be a forward measure, it means that X and Y, are, X and Y, if you remember, are the discounted bonds, right? So those are martingales. And market compatible, it means that it does respects uh, the marginals, right? Mu and nu that we find, which means that if I'm passing under Q T2, I'm recovering all the prices that I observe in the market. So then what does it mean talking of robust pricing? Of course, that I want to understand what is the lower and the upper price given all possible pricing measures. Again, let's just remember that in difference to the original problem, to the, sorry, to the uh, classical Martingale uh, optimal transport, we just know the distribution of the first one, while for the second one, we know that it's dominating some convex order, okay? So this means that we will need uh, some different notion of transport. And luckily, we can indeed rewrite this inf and soup, but we'll concentrate on the inf, soup is the same. We can rewrite the inf problem as some non-classical transport problem, right? We need to do some adapt, adapt in some way and see in which form we can write it. So a little bit of notation that I use in the next slide. I will use pi x for the disintegration of a measure pi with respect to the first marginal. I will use bp for the body center of a measure p. And I will use this uh, smaller equal than c in c as the convex order between two measures. So let's keep in mind this notation. And let's see. So here I just put a few ways we can write this problem, right? So just bear with me a moment. So I assume it's not necessary for all our results, but for simplicity, I assume that mu has no atoms and that C is nice, but these are really minimal assumptions, like lower semi-continuity and some not even boundedness, but weaker form of boundedness. So under some minimal assumptions, here how we can rewrite our problem. So left-hand side, this lower bound for our options, right-hand side, many ways to write it, okay? So let me spend just a moment in each of them. So first of all, what do we have? So well, we have, so here, this is our X1, right? I have a function that depends on some random variable. And the second one, the way I can write it, right? Because for Y2, here is Z is the role of Y2. So for the second one, I don't know the distribution, but I don't know that this is the conditional expectation of some Z for which we know the distribution, right? So if you want here, you already see, well, our problem can be written as uh, some optimization of a random variable with two prescribed distribution, right? This is what we are used to, but then I'm also optimizing over a filtration, okay? So here we are already understanding that this is one of the cases where the information enters into play. It would be the same, for example, if you want to understand like pricing of American options. So you cannot use the classical Martingale transport, but you know that you have to use the information, right? So you know you will have to use uh, some transport, which is a generalization of the classical one where you can, where you have space to put something that is the role of the information. So in this case of just two steps, uh, luckily we can rewrite uh, an optimization as not being over filtration, which is a bit annoying. But we can rewrite, so here about this P lambda, you can forget uh, the explicit description here, but just remember that, uh, keep in mind that lambda is a set of transports, where here I'm transporting a mass instead of, here usually you would have, let's say, R and R, right? But here I'm transporting a point in R to some distributions in R, okay? So here I'm changing a bit from the usual transport setting, right, where I have just transport between two Polish space and another distribution, I'm considering some transports between R and probability on R, where I know the first marginal, and for the second one, I know the intensity, okay? So again, I don't go into details, but um, just to say it's a different kind of transport, and maybe we stay a moment more on the next one, because thanks to this, expressing this as a um, transport problem between R and distribution on R, we can arrive to this formulation, which is what is called 
uh, weak optimal transport. So this was introduced by Goslan and co-authors for uh, in a completely different uh, uh, scope for geometric inequalities. So here we have that the set of transports is the classical one that we know, right? Pi with the, where the two marginal are prescribed. So we are happy here that we find back our friend. But we see that we have something different, right? So usually we have a C of X and Y, right? So this we, see, we saw in the presentation of uh, Jan and Julia. So we, we got refreshed on all the theory of classical optimal transport. So here you notice immediately that the difference between with the classical optimal transport is that the cost function now here it depends on the coupling pi okay and this b if you remember is the body center so again i don't enter into the details but you can see how we go from our problem to different transport where either the costs are already in a different spaces or here we get back to our dear friend but the cost is different and finally, the last one is the one that probably you are more comfortable with because now the inner problem is a very classical transport problem, right? Coupling where the two uh, marginals are known, usual cost function, and we have an additional problem, okay? If we think where we start from, then it's not surprising, right? Because we had this um, problem where we have a cost x1 and y1, right? For x1, we know the distribution. For y1, we don't know, but we know that it's dominated in convex order by nu. So somehow this new prime, right, is not somehow, but it's the distribution of y1, right? So this means that I kind of have two steps, right, transport. So I'm, I will transport nu, which is the distribution of x1, to nu prime, right? So this would be nu prime, and then nu prime to nu. Right, so we will have, we will see now in the example that we have two uh, steps transport. So again, these slides just remember that you know we don't have a classical transport problem, so we have several ways to write it, whether in a different uh, transport class of transport cost function, changing the cost depending on pi. Finally, that the orange one is the one that I want to keep in mind. Okay, so again. First thing that we want to do, right? Once we say, okay, we do have a transport problem, even if it's in a different way. First thing, okay, let's try to say something about uh, duality, right? Because then for us, duality it means that it's sub super replication. Uh, clearly, we can, uh, or let's say, as we can expect, we do have some form of uh, duality. If we look at the first one, I just put because it's nice to see what changes with respect to the classical optimal transport, which is concavity of uh, of one of the two uh, functions in the dual uh, pairs. And the second one, finally, is the one that we really are interested in from the financial perspective, because we have that, uh, as we want, would expect, right, we have some semi-static uh, sub-replication. And here, the only thing that we maybe would have expected is that, so he, this guy here is uh, the blue one, is when we rebalance right our portfolio. So the first one is the static uh, trading. This is the dynamic trading at time one. Just, right, we are just time one, two, and three. So this is the rebalancing right of our portfolio. And then we would have expected that at time one it depends on all the information that we have at time one, right? So in particular x1 and y1. It turns out that it's enough to have uh, to take strategies, self-financing strategies that depend just on Y1. So this is maybe the only thing that was not expected. Otherwise, likely we can recover a, a sub and sub replication exactly as we would like. So I want to conclude with an example. So I have still two, three minutes and then I leave some time for questions. So easier example, uh, call options, right? So now the phi, the function, um, of our P13, right, is just a simple call option, which means that we can write, right, as a function of x1, y1 with this uh, function here. In this case, we will see that both in the lower and upper pricing bound, we can find explicitly primal and dual optimizer, really explicitly. So for the lower pricing bound, so if uh, this is uh, convex by the center uh, with optimal transport, which means why do I write those things? Well, convex because actually in the old theory of weak optimal transport uh, today, up today, uh, the function uh, inside the cost function were always assumed to be convex in the second coordinate, which we do not assume. But in this particular case, we find convexity, so we can use 
also all results from previous literature and barycentric as in uh, in all our fixed income market because it just depends here on the barycenter of uh, the second coordinate. Anyway, so this just to say that in the lower pricing bound for call option, we fall back in uh, to study a specific class of weak optimal transport, which was already studied before. So luckily we can use results from other papers. Thanks to these results, we can find both um, primal and dual optimizers, right? So the primal optimizer, so the optimal transport by star is what is called monotone rearrangement. I will uh, sketch in a second. And explicit sub strategies, which uh, I don't write uh, here because it's not interesting what they exactly are, but just that we can find them, right? And they are very simple. Like the static part is like uh, one short uh, call in a bond and another long call in the other bond and just easy rebalancing at 21. But just a second to keep in mind. So how do we find the lower pricing bound for a call? It's a two-step uh, transport. So I have uh, the, the distribution mu of x1. I have the distribution mu prime. Um, let me be coherent. I have the distribution mu prime of y1. And I have the distribution mu of y2. And here you can write exactly what the transport is. So between x1 and y1 is a monotone distribution. So we know exactly how to write the map t. So the map t that does the transport, this is just the body center of pi. So we have a unique uh, way of transporting new. So x1 and y1, they are uh, co-monotone. This is a monotone transport. And then from y1 to y2, we can go in any with any martingale transport. And this is optimal. Okay, so two-step optimization from x1 to y1 in a monotone way, from y1 to y2 as a margin. Uh, last minute, I uh, want to finish with the upper bound. So upper bound, in a similar way, we can resolve everything explicitly. The nice thing is that in the upper bound, we actually can write the problem as a classical transport problem. So this is a very nice finding that for specific uh, class of cost function, actually, we can write the problem as a classical transport. And again, we can find everything explicitly. So here the picture is much easier, right? So what does it mean classical transport? I don't have this two-step transport, meaning that now I have this distribution mu of x1, uh, the distribution mu1 of y1, and this is now anti monotone transport. And now this is actually, I don't know if I'm able to do the same, more or less. So this is exactly mu1 is equal to mu. Okay, so these are equal almost surely. So actually in this case, uh, y1 is almost surely equal to y2, which means we have this nice relationship between, if you want, time value of the money, right? Uh, and again, we can tell explicitly what is the primal and dual. So I'm going fast just to leave. Uh, I think there is the take home messages, I think is very clear that when we have stochastic discounted, we, you know, even in three time steps, things become more complicated. We cannot use the classical tools from optimal transport, but likely at least in some cases we have weaker, nicer version of optimal transport. And I want to end up with a beautiful picture for my branch last year in Rio. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very thank you much, much uh, Jasmine. Okay. Okay. Have some echo here. Um, okay, let me check on the uh, YouTube chat if anyone has a question. So please, if you have a question, use the the YouTube chat. Unless you are Jorge and you are directly able to. <laughs> Let's speak up. Uh, I actually, let me start with the, maybe just one question or comment, because actually um, your presentation on the weak optimal transport, which I didn't know, actually reminds me of a result that actually might uh, well be stated in the, in, 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 in with a weak optimal transport. Mm -hmm which is actually when it's a very particular result. So it's, it's also linked to one of your last slides when you say, oh, for particular payoffs, actually we have um, basically you can say the weak optimal transport, so the classical optimal transport problem. 
Uh, when you consider the super replication of VIX futures, mm -hmm. given the smiles of the S&P, let's say at T1 and T2, which is uh, separated by 30 days, actually it happens that um, you can always find a solution which is of local volatility type, which is instead of when you are time T1, instead of looking at uh, models, which are Martin Gage models on the S&P that will uh, depend on the observation of the S&P and the VIX at T1, actually you can look at the, the models where if you want the VIX is just a function of the S&P at T1. So only the mm -hmm. information of the S&P at T1 is actually used. And I think that that corresponds to a case, I'm not sure, but based because it's the first time actually that I uh, hear a talk on uh, computer transport, yeah. but it looks like it's, it, yeah, it's a natural formulation for this uh, result. Exactly. So, yeah, this is definitely something we can discuss also more because basically also for VIX option, I think is the, again, you need to go a bit out of the classical transport because again, the point is that you do use filtrations, like, like you know, by, by definition, right? You have some condition expectation. So the point is that I think that weak transport or generalization in multiple step, like this uh, filtered processes that maybe you heard uh, some talks about. So this is the right tool anyway, whenever you want to do pricing of options where the information comes into play, right? So whether it, like, you know, so whether it's American option or VIX, whenever he's also the, some distributional, you know, like, you know, conditional distribution, so something where information comes into play, mm -hmm. then of course, this is the right tool. So I'm sure that one can approach, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, pricing, for example, VIX option with this generalization of, of transport. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Any any other questions? It's already three thirty-two, but maybe we have time for one more question. If somebody has one, Jorgen. Okay, I don't see any question on the YouTube chat. So, given the time, I thank you very much, uh, Beatrice, for joining us and for your very interesting talk.